Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Tell us about some of the work he has been doing um, in Deborah Astin's group. Uh, Jerome graduated from UCLA uh, last May with a PhD and uh, focusing on sensor networks. Uh, in particular, he's been working on uh, time synchronization services and uh, also more recently has been working on this uh, emulation environment for developing sensor net called uh, MSTAR. And, um, and in fact, uh, the uh, topic of uh, today's talk is uh, from time sync to MSTAR, what's really hard in sensor networks. With that, of Jerome. Thank you. So as you heard, time sync at least is where I started out, and that was the topic of my dissertation. Um, and what you're going to be hearing about is a little bit about time synchronization. I'm not going to be covering all 200 pages of it, obviously. Uh, but I'll give you a little flavor of some of the work I did uh, for my dissertation. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the applications. Actually, I think that was one of the strengths of my dissertation, is that it wasn't just sort of theoretical work, but we actually took it all the way out to real applications in the field. Um, and some of these fields were fairly treacherous, as you'll see. Um, and we learned a lot about what actually happens when you take stuff and, from a dissertation and deploy it, and what's really hard in actually in the deployments. That is what led us to MSTAR, which is what you'll be hearing about. There we go. So first, just a quick slide on what is a sensor network. Um, the basic idea is that hardware has gotten smaller, hardware has gotten cheaper, hardware is using less and less energy every day. Um, and so it now is at the point where you can imagine buying hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of little sensors that sense things like light or temperature or chemicals or anything else in the environment and scattering them around and giving scientists a view into the physical world that they've never had before. Um, these are four slides uh, that just sort of show four of the sample application areas uh, that UCLA is working on, uh, doing biocomplexity map mapping in forests, groundwater contamination monitoring in the soil, seismic monitoring, which is certainly very important to us in Southern California, um, and uh, marine microorganisms. And what these all have in common is that it's some phenomenon that you can't see from far away. You can't see, the, for example, the very fine-grained temperature changes in a forest if you're just looking at it with a big centralized sensor or with a satellite. Uh, and so the reason that scientists are really excited about this is because it, fundamentally, because it just gives them this keyhole, it gives them this view into seeing previously fundamentally unobservable phenomena on the environment. So scientists love this idea. Uh, systems researchers have had a hard time with it. They love it because it's a challenge. I say we love it because it's a challenge. Um, the question is, what makes this an interesting problem for systems researchers? So to answer that question, as I will for at least a couple minutes, first it's sort of instructive to think about what's hard about networking in general. What's hard about the internet? Um, well, certainly the scale on the internet is that you've got hundreds of millions of nodes and even more than that in terms of number of users. You've got lots of heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the number of applications, the number of users, and underlying network hardwares and speeds of applications, all sorts of heterogeneity that's got all somehow worked together. You've got failures at every layer at applications, failures of you know, malicious users, failures of routers, failures of everything you can imagine, um, and the network has to somehow keep going. So in sensor networks, we have a lot of these problems. We have all these problems. We certainly are not at the scale of the Internet yet. You know, we're maybe at the scale of hundreds or thousands in sensor networks, but we, still have, we have all these problems. But in addition to all those problems, we've got all these other problems that we didn't see in the Internet, such as a harsh physical environment. We're actually embedded in the physical world. So you have to deal with things like uh, you know, even harsh temperatures or harsh, harsh physical environments. You've got flakier links. You've got uh, links that maybe have bit error rates millions of times higher than on a fiber optic cable. You've got much lower bandwidths. You know, you can usually imagine you've got at least Ethernet and the Internet. Now we're dealing with sometimes these radios that just squeeze out a few hundreds of bytes per second at that. You've got tiny hardware, hardware maybe with very, very little RAM, very little processing power that dies um, constantly, because of, partially because of the finite energy. You've got batteries. You scatter these things around. Uh, when they die because they run out of energy, that's the end of the network. Um, you've got a much lower ratio of humans to nodes. That is, you can imagine a biologist with a bag of a thousand of these things who goes and places them in the forest, not a team of IT people to manage it, but a very low ratio of people to the number of uh, devices they're managing. And there's no pervasive infrastructure. Infrastructure can mean lots of things. It can mean the management infrastructure, as I was just describing. It can mean there's no pervasive power infrastructure. There's no pervasive network infrastructure. 
There are all sorts of infrastructure pieces that you're used to on the Internet that are missing. And it's this last point that I'm going to make a theme for the talk. Um, I could give a talk using any of these things as sort of the driving force of what makes sensor networks hard, but at least for this one, I'll be talking about the fact that there's no pervasive infrastructure. So how do you solve all these problems at the top when you've got all these things that make it difficult at the bottom? And to make this a little bit more concrete, since I'm waving my hands a little bit, I'm going to tell you a story, actually two stories, of two different network partitions that I experienced while I was at UCLA. So the first was just a sort of garden variety internet partition. This is just a big rack full of internet equipment. There are millions of such racks all over the world. We have one, too, at UCLA. We'll probably have dozens of them at UCLA. This is one of ours. One day, somebody plugged one of the wrong cables in the wrong place, and our lab was disconnected from the internet. And uh, I'm the one lucky enough to hear about these kinds of problems when they happen. So users complained to me that they couldn't you know, read their email or surf slash dot or whatever. So I spent half an hour trying to figure it out. It turned out to be a problem with the router. I contacted the router people. They spent a half an hour with all their fancy GUI tools. And it went on and on up the chain until someone figured out one of these cables was plugged into the wrong place and they fixed it. So it took a couple hours. But there were all these people involved. And it was a very sort of interactive process in that there were people that at every layer were intimately involved with applying their intelligence to debugging the network and figuring out what was wrong with it. So this is, on the other hand, a sensor network that I deployed. This is not a contrived example in that this was a real deployment that I was involved in. So when we talk about networking partitions and sensor networks, this is the kind of thing we talk about. This is one of our actual deployments. There are about 100 little nodes all around. You can't quite see them. They're sort of in the grass. Each of them is about this big. And this in the middle is a 55-ton M1A1 Abrams tank, which is driving through the center of it. Of course, it's crushing whatever it encounters. There are nodes on both sides. So you know this thing is going to drive through here for a few minutes. And now at this point, the network is partitioned. So now from a networking standpoint, from a computer science standpoint, if you want to call it that, this is exactly the same problem as the internet partition. So you've got two islands of connectivity, each of which is fine internally, but there's no way to <clears throat> but there's no, you've got two islands of connectivity, but nothing connecting them in between. So from a networking standpoint, it's the same problem. But I think you probably agree that there's something qualitatively different about this network partition in that there's nobody out there, or at least I should say, I'm certainly not going to be the one to run out there in front of the tank with my network analyzer and to, you know, try to figure out what's going on all the nodes and, and try to fix this. So the difference is that even though it's sort of the same network partition, in this case, the nodes are completely on their own. They've got to figure out what's going on. They've got to heal the failure. The application running on top of the network has to keep running. And the whole thing has to happen in some very automated, autonomous, really autonomous way, much more so than on the internet, where you've got all these people who are constantly managing it and are capable of looking at problems manually. So now I promised you at the beginning I was going to talk about time synchronization, which I haven't yet, so I should start doing that. Um, so let's imagine how does the network partition affect time synchronization in the internet, and how does it affect it in the sensor network? Well, if you look at the way that time synchronization is done on the internet, generally, from the 10,000 foot view is that you have a master node somewhere which is elected as the guy who knows what time it is. He canonically knows, okay, I know the time is t equals 30. And you've got a whole bunch of nodes that are out down here connected through some topology. And the master just says, I know what time it is. The time is t equals 30. That's it. So it's fairly easy. Um, they all just, uh, the, the model for how you use time synchronization, if you're an application developer, is also fairly simple is you just assume there's some synchronization process which is underlying. Um, in the internet, the network time protocol, or NTP, is usually what you assume is there. And you can assume that this process is constantly running, and the service model is that you have a clock, and it's always right, and you just ask what time is it, and you get the right answer. Now, what happens if you get a partition? Our tank drives through the center of the network. The network gets partitioned. Um, let's say now we've got two halves of the network. Um, each of which is still operating, but now there's something preventing them from talking to each other. How would this happen? Or what, do we, what does this look like now sort of from our time synchronization standpoint? Well, the most trivial version of it is just that these guys now are no longer in touch with the master, so they lose synchronization completely, which is certainly not a good situation. But if you imagine a slightly more advanced version, you can imagine that this partition realizes it's partitioned. It elects its own master. This side is synchronized. The top is synchronized. The problem is that there's nothing keeping the two masters synchronized with each other. That is, even if each partition is internally synchronized, they're not synchronized to each other. Now, how does this, how do we deal with this in the internet? It's pretty easy. We assume infrastructure. Infrastructure is often the answer in the internet. In the, in the internet, you assume that there is this GPS satellite constellation, which is around, which can beam time to many different places in the network. And so by virtue of this infrastructure, you can have lots and lots of different masters 
in the network, all of which are implicitly, or I should say explicitly synchronized with each other through this out-of-band mechanism. So even if you have partitions, it doesn't matter because you're always, there's always a master which is synchronized to all the other masters, which is on your side of the partition. So this is an example where infrastructure makes the problem much easier. Now, what if we are in a sensor network? Imagine now you know, we're in this field with a tank driving through it where there's no GPS. In fact, we were forbidden in that demo from using GPS. I'll talk a little bit about that demo later in the talk. Um, how would you deal with synchronization in that case? So the way we deal with it, when you uh, can't assume this infrastructure, when you can't assume you have multiple masters that are synchronized with each other, is we sort of turn synchronization on its head and say that there shouldn't be a master clock at all. That is, you assume that you have a bunch of nodes, each of which has its own clock, each of which runs at its own rate, and which is never set to any explicit value. It just runs, it just sets some arbitrary value, and the synchronization service now, the time synchronization service, is no longer responsible for actually setting the value of any of these clocks, but instead it builds up this series of relationships to its neighbors. That is, this guy now knows it's eight seconds behind this guy, this guy knows it's one second behind this guy, it's, let's say, one second ahead of this guy. So what this lets you do is sort of get rid of this notion of a master clock, and therefore it's much easier to deal with this idea, it's much easier to deal with a partition. In other words, if a partition comes in, it cuts off some piece of the network, or it partitions the network into two different portions, the top can continue operating, the bottom can continue operating. The idea, though, is that if the network partition heals at some point later, these links, these edges that relate clocks to each other, can reform after the partition heals, and you can use them post facto to relate data that was collected during the time of the partition. So to make this a little bit more explicit, what I mean is we're actually changing the service model of time synchronization. We're no longer just assuming that you have a synchronized clock and what you ask is what time is it. We're now breaking the service model into these two separate questions. The first is what time is it here according to my local undisciplined clock. This is a question that you can always ask 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter if the network is up or down. And the second is for some given time here, what time is it there? That is converting some value according to my clock to a value according to somebody else's clock. Now this may not be a valid question during a time of network partition, but if the two halves of the network are partitioned, they can continue collecting data during the time of the partition. They can keep asking what time is it here, and then defer the second question, the conversion step, until the time that the partition heals. So essentially what this shows us is that if you change the model of synchronization, what it lets you do is express, very naturally express a much wider range of scenarios that is more apt to represent the kind of things that we see in sensor networks. In the internet, we can just assume that synchronization is running. We can assume even if there's a partition, you have a master which is on your side of the partition. But this idea of removing the global clock does is it lets you much more naturally deal with problems such as network partitions without breaking the service model. So this is one example, at least, of sort of this nice trick that you can play, which ends up, for, at least for, for time synchronization, ends up uh, cha sort of changing the model that we use in the internet so that it's more appropriate for sensor networks. This is sort of a question of what do you do with the if, assuming you have some underlying synchronization process which is capable of determining the relationship between your clock and somebody else's clock, this sort of addresses the question of what do you do with all that information. So a second question, sort of almost an orthogonal question, is how do you do those experiments? That is, how do you actually determine the relationship between your clock and some neighbor's clock? Again, this is an area where we can, there's sort of a traditional solution that people use on the internet, but again, in wireless sensor networks, we can make a change and again, get an improvement. So, in traditional synchronization, essentially the way, that, uh, the way that you determine the relationship between two neighbor clocks is you simply generate a packet at the sender. Um, the packet will say something like, at the tone, the time is t equals 1. You send the packet to the receiver. The receiver says, ah, okay, I got this packet. I know now the time is t equals 1. The problem, of course, is that by the time the packet actually gets to the receiver, the time is no longer 1 because some time has elapsed in sending the packet. So a common fix to this is to... Uh, send a round trip packet, that is a packet from the sender to the receiver and then back again. If you know the round trip time, you divide it by two, you can get some estimate of the one-way latency. The problem with this is that um, if, the latency, if the two forward and reverse latencies are different, that is if the path is in any way asymmetrical, um, or if the, um, excuse me, if there's some random event that occurs, let's say in the forward direction that doesn't occur in the reverse direction, um, then the uh, 
the round trip time is no longer, if the round trip time is no longer symmetrical, then dividing it by two is no longer an estimate of the latency, or no longer an accurate estimate. So what we can do in sensor networks is something slightly different. We can take advantage of some of the domain knowledge we have in sensor networks, which is that we know that this is a, sensor networks are wireless. Wireless networks have a broadcast channel. Broadcast channels have this property that you know you can send a message which is received physically by more than one receiver. And we can sort of change synchronization a bit so that instead of sending a time value, instead what we just do is simply send a packet which is recognizable, that is it has a sequence number or some other thing that makes it unique. Two or more receivers then receive the packet. I'll usually just talk about two for, uh, sort of for the purposes of the talk, but whenever I say two, you can imagine I mean N. Two receivers receive the same packet. One says, I saw it at t equals four. The other one says, I saw it at t equals five. They know they saw it. Their local clocks saw it one second apart. So they can conclude from this common event that they both observed that their clocks must be one second apart. So I've explained now at least there is a way, if you assume you have a broadcast channel, that you can do synchronization in some different way than the traditional sort of sender to receiver synchronization. The question is, why would you want to do this? Does it actually help you at all? So it turns out the reason that you'd want to make this change to synchronization of sort of synchronizing between a pair of receivers rather than from a sender to a receiver is that it changes the critical path or it changes the portion of the packet sending process which is, sub which in, which is in the critical path and therefore it can potentially inject error into the synchronization. That is, if you have sender sort of this traditional sender to receiver synchronization, when you send a packet, everything from the moment at which the sender reads its clock to generate the packet to the moment at which the receiver receives the packet and it looks at its clock is all in the critical path. That is, if there's any delay there, it all becomes synchronization error. In our scheme, which is called RBS, or Reference Broadcast Synchronization, um, the critical path is different. That is, it no longer matters when the packet was sent exactly. The essence of it is that we are generating an event which is received by two or more receivers and the only thing that matters is that this event was generated at the same time and they all saw it at about the same time. So it no longer matters now exactly how long it took for the packet to get onto the channel, how long it took to get down through the resender stack or anything like that. All that matters is that at some point it makes it onto the channel and then propagates in almost exactly the same amount of time to all the receivers. So we've changed the critical path between traditional synchronization and reference broadcast synchronization. The question is now again, does this improve the error characteristics? It turns out the answer is yes, because if you actually decompose where does most of the latency come from in sending a packet, or more precisely, where does the non-determinism in the latency come from, most of it comes from the sender, not from the receiver. That is, the process of sending a packet is much less deterministic than the process of receiving a packet. When you try to send a packet, you have to go through the whole MAC layer. That is, you have to claim the channel, which involves either waiting for the channel to be clear, if it's 8 or 2 to 11, you have to go through RTS, ETS, packet exchanges. Um, if it's, let's say, uh, if it's some sort of TDMA scheme, you have to wait for your slot. No matter what the MAC layer is, there's always some delay. And it's usually delay that's transparent to the application, and it's delay which is often very random. It changes from packet to packet. On the receiver, there's usually very, very little delay. The packet arrives from the channel, and it physically, it physically arrives, it gets detected, and it immediately gets passed up to the, to the, uh, to the application. So the difference between RBS and traditional synchronization is that RBS takes this whole non-deterministic sending process, packet sending process, out of the critical path. Um, if you can do that, it certainly helps. Um, but it turns out, at least for most of the platforms that we've been using, I think actually for most platforms generally, not just the ones we've been using, it's extremely difficult at a high layer, such as the application, to get a very precise time stamp of when a packet leaves the local, when it leaves the host, that is when it gets generated. It's, so they often do give you a, they give you an interrupt, but so there are a few different issues. One is, so partially it's a software issue in that there's sort of an asynchrony between the process of creating a packet and getting feedback back to the application layer at when the packet was actually, when it ended up going out. That is, on the receiver, there's data that's already flowing up from the, op from the NIC to the operating system to the application, which is the data itself. It's easy to annotate that with the time at which the packet was received and pass that up in parallel. On the sender, there's this asynchrony in that there's data flowing down, which is sort of discordant with 
information coming back which, of the times at which the packets went out. And because of that sort of discord, at least in systems that we've used, or at least every system I've ever used, it ends up being very difficult to get the, to, to have that information come back and get accurate send times. Also, there turns out not to be a tight timing relationship between the time at which you get this interrupt, the buffer, for, it, it, in, in other words, the, the interrupt doesn't actually tell you when the packet goes out on the wire in many cases. It tells you when you can, when the buffer is free, when you can DNA another packet in. And so, for various reasons, there's a fairly loose timing relationship between that interrupt and when the packet actually went out onto the wire, whereas there's a very, at least we found, a very tight timing relationship between when you get the receiver interrupt and when the packet actually had arrived. Did you measure that? We did. That's the next slide. Is that at least for one of the? <clears throat> this is so. This isn't. This is a measurement. It's not all measurements. And this is one platform. Um, this platform, in fact, was in the Berkeley Moat platform, which is um, at least it was one of the first reference platforms for sensor networks. And what we did is we took two moats and attach them both to a logic analyzer that uh, would just measure the time between when they uh, generated sort of a GPIO uh, pin going high. We put a very simple program on both moats which just said, watch for packets and just fire this GPIO pin whenever you see a packet. And then have the logic analyzer just emit the phase error between these two GPIO events. Then we took the third mode and just told it to transmit a couple thousand packets. And this is the distribution of the results. So what you see is that it's more or less Gaussian. There is a fairly, uh, these are one microsecond buckets. There is a fairly high, um, uh, the, the zero bucket is fairly large, um, but the chi squared of the Gaussian fit is fairly high. It's 99.97. The tail of the distribution is plus and minus 53 microseconds. This is, in fact, a magic number because this is the width of a bit. These radios were 19.2K, which means each bit is 53 microseconds wide. What we were actually expecting was to see that so, so you know that the receiver has to be locked on at least within one bit time, because if it couldn't distinguish one bit from the next, it wouldn't be able to receive the message at all. What we were expecting was actually a uniform distribution within that bit time. What we found was this nice Gaussian distribution, which lets you do some fancy statistical things with it. Um, so this is on the order of microseconds. If you look at the Motes Mac, the amount of time it takes to send a packet is many, many, it's hundreds of times larger. It's on the order of milliseconds to send a, or the jitter in sending a packet. That is the jitter in claiming the channel. You're talking about the, the max right, sure. right. So this is at least something we were able to easily measure for a moat. We don't have quite the same direct measurement for other platforms, such as 802.11 and wired ethernet and that kind of thing, but we've seen similar results uh, that w the receive time is typically extremely tight bet the, between when you get the interrupt and when you get the packet, whereas the send time is usually much more difficult to measure from software. So given that there is this, underlying process in, that exists in the system, this nice deterministic process, how do you construct a time synchronization system out of this? That's the next thing we did. So what we do is send a number of broadcasts over time and see how the phase error between two receivers grows. That is to say, so here's a graph, this is actually a snapshot of our running system. What we have on the x-axis is time. So this is a 200 second window of the most recent 200 seconds worth of reference broadcasts that were sent. Each of these red diamonds is a single reference broadcast. On the y-axis is the difference in time between when two receivers saw that broadcast according to their local clocks. So there's no absolute time in this, but they don't know in any absolute sense what time they saw these broadcasts. They just report at what time they saw the broadcast according to their local clocks and subtract them, and the graph is just normalized to zero, zero. So what you see is that, so first of all, this isn't flat. This changes, that there's a slope to this graph, and that's because the clocks are running at slightly different rates. So in this case, after 200 seconds, the clocks drifted apart by about 550 microseconds, which just shows that clocks are not perfect. You buy a whole bunch of oscillators that are all actually ticking at slightly different rates. The fact that these diamonds are not exactly on, the cur on this line, but slightly above and below, is because they're all selected from that Gaussian distribution that you saw on the previous slide. So what we can do then, if we have a pair of receivers that view a bunch of these broadcasts in common and draws this least squared linear regression line, is what we end up with is a transfer function, essentially, between all clock values on one clock versus clock values on another. Um, this, there are a few nice properties of this. One is that it doesn't depend on every single one of these diamonds being here. Of course, if you see packet losses, you do in a couple of places, you can just continue drawing the line through the remaining uh, points. And the other nice thing is that if you have something that happens sort of during the time you were synchronized, of course, you get the best accuracy because it's somewhere nice right here in the middle. But you can, of course, extrapolate this line backwards 
into the past or forwards into the future. And now this gives us a more concrete idea of how we can handle network partitions, as I was talking about earlier. You can collect data during a time of a network partition, even if there's no synchronization, no network available. And then sometime later, when the network comes back, you can start sending these nice reference broadcasts. You extrapolate this backwards, and then you can hypothesize and say, had we been synchronized at this time in the past when we were collecting data, what would the relative value of our clocks been? Mm -hmm. Does this continue to work just as well when the batteries are low? When the batteries are low. So I'll assume what you mean is when the... Um, so. What does it introduce into the system if you assume that people are running out of energy or is running out of energy just the binary event where all of a sudden you're out of energy and you stop? So I... Fail stop is certainly a nice um, failure method. So I'll answer the question I think you may be asking, which is what happens if the frequency changes over time? Um, so what you see in this window is that the clocks, although they're running at different rates, are running at the same rate. The, the two clocks are running at different rates from each other, but each one is running at the same rate over time. That is, each frequency doesn't drift. What you see in real oscillators, of course, do things such as voltage fluctuations, temperature fluctuations, shock, all sorts of other environmental factors, is that the frequency of clocks does change over time. So certainly, you can't extrapolate this back forever. The further you extrapolate it back, the worse the accuracy is going to be. The more environmental problems there are, the worse the accuracy is going to be. But there are all sorts of knobs in here which you can turn to do things like trade off energy for accuracy. Um, so that, this turns out to be very crucial in sensor networks, is that we always like having knobs to trade off tr energy for anything, because energy is such a crucial resource in sensor networks. So one obvious one is that you can just send more or fewer of these pulses, and the more these you send, the better the you know the better you can sort of lock onto what the the relationship is between your two clocks. You can sort of tighten the vice grip around that Gaussian distribution. Um, another is you can essentially so you can control how much time elapses in your application between when an event happens that you're interested in and when you do the synchronization. That is, if you think that the temperature is fairly constant, if the oscillators are fairly well behaved and microsecond accuracy isn't that important to you, you can spend an entire day collecting data and then send a few of these pulses at the end of the day and extrapolate back and correct for all the, everything that happened for the whole 24-hour period. Or you can shorten that to five minutes, or you can just run it continuously. These are all sort of points along the spectrum of trading off energy for accuracy. Mm -hmm. Or you can um, find out the history, the time rate of change, and try to fit a, um, something other than linear curve to it. Yes, yes, yes. Because oscillators are much better behave than being random like that. Yes, yes. Um, or another way, or you can, uh, again, another way to spend energy is, for example, buy a temperature compensated oscillator. Or you can always spend more and more money on oscillators to have them be better and better behaved so that they do, in fact, get closer and closer to looking linear. Um, in our case, usually what we'll do is, is sort of software solutions closer to what you're describing. Of, uh, if it's very important, for example, you can keep a history of the evolution of this curve over time, that kind of thing. So I'm, uh, I'm a little confused at how plotting more points will improve your accuracy if what you're interested in is not the accuracy between the points, but the, if you're extrapolating into the past, right. knowing more about the curve right now doesn't, you know, knowing, knowing with five, you know, five millisecond accuracy, your you know, samples that are close together right now doesn't tell you much about what happened in the past because the temperature change might, might be done now. Yes, yes. So if, if there's a significant frequency change in the past, Doing lots and lots of these uh, experiments in the present isn't going to help you. Where it can help you is, so if you imagine, let's say, some, <laughs> if you imagine, let's say, the error sort of being an error in the angle, in some sense, or the slope of this curve, then the further back in the past you go, the better of an angle, sort of equal angular errors end up being more phase error in the end. So you can, you can certainly do, you can send more and more pulses and get this to be more and more accurate, certainly. I think the issue you're raising, though, is if you go far, far enough in the past, the error due to this jitter eventually gets swamped by error in the evolution of the frequency over time of the, of the oscillator itself. So this is actually, I think, it's something that's just true of essentially any time synchronization scheme. That is, one of the nice things about this scheme is that in the worst case, it always essentially will just decompose back to traditional time synchronization. The nice thing about this is that it represents all sorts of situations very naturally that traditional time sync doesn't, such as being able to do post facto synchronization or coordination, future actuation of events in the future. It has all the same basic physical limitations. So I gave this talk once and somebody said, well, what if you know, the network dies and during the time of partition, the frequencies completely change and then they all go back to the same and then the network comes back again. Well, of course, in that situation, there's nothing that this or any other scheme will do because there's just not the physical information that you need is not there. 
the nice thing about this is that it's a way to essentially organize the same information that traditional synchronization has in a way that is much, I think, much more flexible and can much more easily represent a much wider range of situations. Um, in addition, the idea of using broadcasts rather than unicast um, has this uh, effect of each of these points also is selected from this much nicer Gaussian distribution, which gives you better accuracy, which I'll also be talking about more in just one second. Yeah. Which one of them, in, in any of them, do you think you need microsecond accuracy? Oh, absolutely. In fact, that one we did use microsecond accuracy. Um, do you handle that? I will. I'll expand on it a little bit more in just a sec in probably three or four slides. But the short version is that what that was doing was acoustic localization. Mm -hmm. With acoustic localization, you're measuring time of flight of sound. Okay. Each sample, we're sampling sound at 48 kilohertz, which means each sample is about 20 microseconds wide. And signal processing people tell us they want time resolution to within about a tenth of a sample, which is two microseconds. So yeah, we were actually right. We absolutely need all the accuracy we have. Yeah, but you don't really get two microseconds in your face. I mean, the, the Gaussian is, is an order of magnitude wider. Uh, so we are, we, we're not getting it certainly with modes. We were for more on the order of about 10 microseconds. But with 8 or 2 to 11, which I'll be showing in just one second, we were actually getting microsecond resolution. Yep. It's a great question. Um, there was a paper written by, um, so I wrote an original, one of the first papers on this that I wrote was uh, a bunch of people up at ICSI, or I should say now that we're here down at ICSI read it. And Richard Karp and Scott Schenker contacted me and said, we think there's something really interesting you can do here with global synchronization. And they wrote a paper which was, which frankly I only understood half of, <laughs> but which is by the people who understood the theory behind it, was a, a, apparently a really nice paper, which essentially showed that there are certain, if you essentially take all of the information throughout the entire network, that is, this just shows sort of between two receivers, but if you look at all the information globally, they came up with a scheme where they proved you can come up with optimal time synchronization, which for them meant that all paths sum to zero. But it turns out, even though you get this global optimum, the individual pairwise synchronization was also optimum. It was a really nice result. So technically, I can't say I looked at it, but they did, uh, based on my work. Yep. Um, in the video world, they, they have, they have time-based correctors for a long time, and they're able to um, uh, time-based correct to four and a half orders of magnitude. It's something between a uh, slipping um, tape on a flywheel down to uh, less than half a nanosecond. So that the uh, slipping tape is somewhere around 60 microseconds, and they're able to do something like that. But they characterize the, the uh, time rate of change of the oscillator, uh, and they're able to correct down to half a nanosecond in a typical tape recorder. Mm -hmm. So if you have, uh, you can certainly get, so time synchronization is one of these interesting areas where you should never believe a paper that gives you simulation results of time synchronization and gives you numbers at the end. Because time sync is maybe 50% about the software and the algorithms, and the other 50% is about the specifics of the radio you're using, the hardware you're using. It's one of these areas where you can absolutely throw money at the problem. And you, know, you can buy better and better oscillators and better and better networks and you know, this and that. So it's something that you certainly can just, if you just want to get the number to be as small as possible, you, know, you can go off the deep end and do what the US Naval Observatory does and buy you know, 60 cesium and hydrogen maser clocks and you know, sort of assemble them into this ensemble. I think so, personally, my research hasn't focused on, been, has not been on building better clocks or on building better bit detectors or, or anything like that, but it's given a bit detector with some given determinism, how can we best utilize it? Well, that was my point, was that it was essentially a software, actually a hardware implemented piece of software yeah. that did the correction for four and a half orders of magnitude. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm going to move on just a bit and give you some concrete results. So maybe I'm hand waving a little bit too much. I'm always very conscious of not wanting to hand wave too much. So, so I'm, again, I'm sort of arguing that you can send more and more of these points, and this should be very accurate. I actually have some now some results to try to make this more concrete. Uh, the previous slides were uh, uh, one of the first pl platforms that we used, which were on the Berkeley modes. These are now on uh, compact IPACs, which are PDAs with uh, 802.11 wireless Ethernet network interfaces attached to them. In this case, the network interface is much faster. It's 11 megabits per second, so the bits are only 100 nanoseconds wide. So what we expect to see is that that Gaussian is much smaller, has a much sm smaller sigma. So this is a CDF of the error that we saw with our scheme versus NTP. Uh, NTP is on the right here. This is error on the x-axis, which is on a log scale. 
And on the y-axis, we have the cumulative um, frequency at which we saw the error of some given magnitude. This is the CDX, I think I said. So the first uh, curve here on the right is um, NTP. This is sort of this garden variety NTP that we downloaded off the internet. Um, we did spend a fair amount of time sort of tweaking it and tuning it to make sure we were getting the best performance we could out of it. We turned it up to its maximum update rate, which is sending a packet every 16 seconds. And we have a GPS steered NTP reference clock in our uh, lab. And then with these NTP synchronized IPACs that we allowed to synchronize for like two days, we told them to execute an event at what they thought should be exactly the same time. Again, this event was raising a GPIO pin high and then attaching them to a logic analyzer and asking what the phase error was. The average error was 51 microseconds. Now, on the scale of NTP results, this is actually quite a good result. Usually in the literature, people were, well, over the Internet, there's a lot of jitter, so you usually see microsecond level synchronization. But for LAN, like Ethernet synchronization, usually you see, people usually quote about 100 microseconds as being what NTP can do. With reference broadcast synchronization, uh, apples to apples, that is the same hardware, same operating system, which was Linux, um, and more, most importantly, the same system interface. That is, we did, we wrote our software with the exact same limitations of NTP, which is that you go into select, you block there, and then the first time you can timestamp the packet is when select returns in user space. Uh, other than that, everything else, or everything the same, we got an average of six microseconds with RBS compared to this 51 with NTP, or about eight times better. Uh, the third line you see here on the left, this red line, is again our scheme, it's RBS. The only change we made between the red and the green is that whereas the green is a pure user space implementation, the red we added just a tiniest bit of kernel help, which is that the Linux kernel has this standard feature which you can turn on, which is that it timestamps incoming packets in the interrupt handler. And then if you use a different system call to read the packet, it gives you the kernel acquired timestamp in addition to the data itself. Just making that one change and nothing else, the synchronization error went down again to one and a half microseconds. Now, the resolution of the clock on these things is one microsecond, which is this vertical line here. Um, as you can see, in fact, half of the trials were able to synchronize better than the clock resolution. So I actually think this was a result which was limited by the resolution of the clock on the IPAC. Um, and again, this makes sense because we would expect that the network itself is fast enough and that the Gaussian should only have a sigma of, let's say, around 50 nanoseconds or so, since the bit width is 100 nanoseconds. So the takeaway point from this slide is RBS is better. Now, I did a whole lot of hand-waving earlier explaining, you know, non-determinism this and sender non-determinism that. And my theory, at least, for why RBS is better is that we've taken the process of sending a packet out of the critical path. It's just the receiving delay, which is in the critical path at this point. The question is, is that really why RBS is better? Well, it turns out there's a fairly easy way to, to determine if that's the case. This test was done on an entirely idle network, um, or idle, I should say, except for the synchronization traffic that was going on. We repeated this experiment on a heavily loaded network, uh, exactly the same, except that now instead of an idle 11 megabit per second network, we added about 6.5 megabits per second of aggregate offered load. What we saw was that NTP degraded severely. It used to be around here at 50 mic 51 microseconds. It came all the way out here to 1,542 microseconds. Again, remember, this is a log scale. And RBS, we would expect, should remain just about exactly the same. In fact, it degraded slightly from 6 to 8 microseconds. And that 2 microseconds actually it keeps me honest because this was a real protocol implementation in that it wasn't sort of a desk experiment. This was actual software which had actual control traffic. And what happened there was that the level of cross traffic was so high that a lot of just the control packets from our scheme were getting lost, which occasionally would lead to these phase excursions as uh, some of the newer data was getting lost. And we had to continue using older data for, for 30 seconds or whatever until the next update came. So the reason for this is because when there's a huge amount of cross traffic, the process of sending a packet now becomes much less deterministic in that when you go to acquire the channel, now there's much more likely, it's much more likely there'll be some cross traffic that is there at that instant, which causes you to delay before acquiring the channel. So an NTP, which depends intimately on the forward and reverse paths being symmetrical, it no, once that, that assumption is broken, it can no longer do a good latency estimate and the accuracy severely degrades. What we see with RBS is that it doesn't matter what time the packet is sent, so it's not affected by the cross traffic. Okay, so now I've given you this great song and dance, and yeah, go ahead. How many NTP servers were you using? Uh, in that case, it was uh, our own NTP server, essentially. It was, a G we had a GPS receiver in our lab that we were synchronizing to directly. So 
hopefully at this point, what I've convinced you of is that RBS is great and it cures tooth decay and all these other wonderful things. But I did make this fairly strong assumption, um, which is the question I haven't gotten yet, which is that it assumes that there is a broadcast channel. That is, you can send a single packet which is received by N receivers. In sensor networks, we usually think of these being fairly large networks. And by large, I mean the scope of the network is much larger than the extent of any individual transmission. So the question is, is there some way to fix this? Can we continue using RBS even in networks like this? So the answer is yes. Um, the question is, is there some way, which is what I'll be describing now, of synthesizing multiple disconnected broadcast domains into a single global time scale without losing the crucial property that made RBS so good to begin with, which is that it only ever depends on the relationship between when two receivers saw a packet never depends on the relationship between the send time of a packet and the receive time of a packet, only two receivers. So the question is, can we synthesize multiple broadcast domains into a single global time scale without violating that property? It turns out there's a fairly uh, nice way to do that, which is easy sort of after the fact, at least, after you see it, which is now imagine we've got this car which is driving through this network, and we've got a bunch of moats in the field, each of which can detect if the car is there. And let's say we put some simple software on here which just says watch for some synchronization pulse, watch for the car, and report at what time you saw the car relative to whatever pulse you might have seen. And then we'll elect two nodes here, which I'll call the red and the blue, each of which sends a single packet, a single broadcast as a synchronization pulse. So let's say the car starts out here. This mode might say I saw the car zero seconds after the blue pulse, and this guy saw it one second after. And then sometime later, the car gets over here. And this guy says, I saw it one second after the red pulse. I saw it three seconds after the red pulse. So now if you want to do something like compute the speed or trajectory of the car, you can do that within this small area and within this area. The question is, can we synthesize these into one global total ordering? Well, we got very lucky in this example because it just so happened there was this moat right here in the center. And this moat didn't even see the car, but it did see both synchronization pulses, the red and the blue. And it can add this constraint to the system. I saw the red pulse two seconds after the blue one. Well, if you know red happened two seconds after blue, and the car was here one second after red and here one second after blue, then you can conclude this car was here two seconds after it was here. So what this demonstrates is, in no case here did we ever put into the critical path the time at which a packet was sent. We're only ever looking at packet reception times. And yet we still have this global time scale, a total ordering of events, which spans broadcast domains. So how does this work in the actual system? This is sort of the theory behind it. What the actual system does is not sort of constraint, reasoning about constraints, as I was just describing. But imagine now we've got this sort of uh, this physical topology, where we've got a bunch of nodes here. All the numbered ones are receivers. These larger lettered ones are senders. And these colored regions are the broadcast regions of these lettered nodes. Now, in this case, I'm making sort of this explicit distinction between senders and receivers. In the actual system, most nodes can play both roles. Um, so let's say now. Uh, B, for example, sends a broadcast, and then 5 and 6 are synchronized because they both saw B's broadcast, and so with 5 and 7 and 6 and 7. What you can do now is take this logical topology and change it, or this physical topology, and instead redraw it as a logical topology, where now there's an edge between every pair of nodes for which there's some known clock relationship because these nodes saw an event in common. They both saw the same broadcast. So the senders now are not even in this graph because they are unsynchronized with the receivers. This, by the way, is the reason why nodes play both roles in the actual system. They are both senders and receivers, but all nodes are synchronized. But at least in this example, we have senders and receivers as separate roles. So when you draw the logical topology, the senders aren't even in it. There is an edge between each of pair of receivers that's in the same broadcast domain. Each of these edges, in fact, is one of those diagonal blue lines that you saw earlier. It's one of those transfer functions between two clocks which takes into account both the phase and skew relationship of the clocks. So now, if you see an event up here at node 1 and down here at node 11, to uh, compare those two events to each other, all you have to do is find a path through this graph. A path through this graph is a series of conversions from one clock to the next, taking into account the phase and skew at each hop, so that you end up with two sensor readings at the end once they've been through the series of conversions, which are both according to the same time scale and can therefore be com compared to each other. So this also, there was a question before about the global uh, sort of uh, uh, 
zero length cycles and whatnot. Essentially, what that boils down to is instead of picking one route to this graph, sort of taking, in some sense, the average of all possible routes to the graph. So one of the other nice properties of this is that if you recall, so each of these is one of those, each of these edges is actually one of those diagonal blue lines. Each of those diagonal blue lines is um, the linear regression selected from an independent Gaussian distribution. All of these Gaussian distributions at each top are independent. Uh, they're completely separate data. What this means is that if you sum up the, the sum of the variances of all of these independent Gaussians, and excuse me, the total variance of this ends up being, or I should say the standard deviation of n hops ends up being only the square root of the number of hops larger than the variance at each hop. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Such as this, yeah. So in this case, That's a, yeah. So in this case, eight and nine are in C, both in the C and D domain. Right. And so in this case, I've drawn yeah, two edges between them. Is that what you meant? No, I meant that I don't see just a single. Okay. Uh, the air clip. Not, not multi-edges, right? Just, Oh, okay, 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 right, because it is different here. I, I agree. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is actually going, I think, the last, is this the last? Where is this? Did things stop working? Okay. So this at least has been the whirlwind tour of at least a couple of the chapters of my dissertation. Um, this is at least the basic fundamentals about how we were able to do time synchronization over multiple hops and with high precision. So the next portion of this was, well, what can you do with this? Which leads me to a couple uh, application anecdotes. So the first is, uh, this is actually one of our first test beds at UCLA. Um, these are moats that are down here. Um, and each of them has been specially modified with um, a little audio amplifier and a speaker. Um, and then up here on these very fake looking trees, because in fact they're not real trees, these are fake trees, are these uh, again compact IPACs. Uh, and the goal of this system was to localize the position of these moats in three dimensions. And so what they would do is the moats would emit a sound, and then the IPACs, there were about eight of them, uh, would detect the sound. They'd all, everything would be time synchronized through uh, all the technology which I was just describing earlier. And using all of that, it was able to time the time of flight of the audio between the moat when it generated it and when it was received there. Uh, this was in conjunction with a number of other people, one of whom is Lou Gerode, who did all the signal processing aspects of it. His real contribution to this um, was the signal, pro the, uh, instead of just being an, a single impulse, what the acoustic was is actually fairly long. It was actually like a three quarter of a second long sort of CDMA-like uh, M sequence. It was 511 bits encoded in the audio, which lets you run a sliding correlator over it on the receiver. The result being, the, you're able to, he was actually able to detect down to a single acoustic sample exactly when the audio arrived. Um, it was extremely good at rejecting things like echoes. So he had done all the work of, OK, I know exactly when this audio arrived. The question is, when was this sample acquired? That was where the time synchronization came in. Um, so each of these, he was able to detect within a sample, of sometimes two samples of when the audio arrived. It's averaged over lots of different IPACs. And the end result was we were able to localize moats to down to within about a centimeter. So this was a very successful demo system. But it was a demo system. Um, what I mean by that is, so for example, the interface was you would, let's say, type into the laptop, I'd like to know the position of node 3. It would send a message to node 3. Node 3 would make a sound. Uh, and then the position of node 3 would pop up on a chart, like a, on a GUI. Um, the, um, so not everything is a broadcaster on the RBS scheme. Some of them are broadcasters. Some of them aren't. We manually elect which ones are broadcasters. The thing had to be sort of set up. And there was a lot of sort of manual configuration, as you'd expect from almost any demo. The thing worked. And the basic technology pieces of sort of the time sync and the signal processing that Lou did were all sort of very solid. But there was a lot of sort of cruft surrounding it, which had to be manually configured and was somewhat brittle. Now, why do I bring this up? Because we built this system. And then for two years, both Lou and I worked um, part-time at a startup called Sensoria while we were doing our PhDs. And one of the first things that we did at Sensoria was essentially build this system sort of for real. 
that is, Tensoria got this contract from DARPA, where what DARPA wanted to do was take these nodes, um, that were these weren't modes, these were much bigger, uh, things that ran Linux, and put them out into a field that a tank would eventually be driving through, as you saw, um, and wanted these things to collaboratively build a map of where they were. This is a meter grid, so you can see you get some sense of the sort of the scale of this, um, and that these were on the order of maybe 10 meters apart. The first of these was, uh, I think, about, well, it was sort of a number of stage demos that got bigger and bigger. The last one was about 90 nodes. So now there are tanks driving through here. What was the radio range? Sorry? What was the range of radio? The radio range, actually, you can see. So from this GUI, I've never gotten this question before, but it gives me a chance to show off some of the features of this wonderful GUI that we spent you know, a week writing. Um, so in this case, the, uh, these lines here, these colored lines, are radio links between the nodes. So the radio range is actually fairly non-deterministic, as unfortunately is very characteristic of low-power radios. Um, so you can see there is this one link that spans the entire network from one edge to the other. There are other cases where there are two nodes right next to each other that can't hear each other. So nominally, it's maybe 20 meters or so. Um, but of course, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of temporal variation also. It would change over time or when a tank drives through. Even you know, just sort of the electromagnetic characteristics of a tank would sometimes change it even more so than the sort of crushy aspects of a tank. So the difference between this system... That's a high sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Is there a question somewhere in there that I can answer, or should I go ahead? <laughs> so... So the difference, so now you might say, so, what, uh, so I should first describe the application because the application was kind of cool. Step one was to build this map so that they can all figure out where they are relative to each other. Step two is if one of the nodes disappears, which is army speak for destroyed by an enemy, then they actually wanted other nodes to physically move in to fill in the spaces. Uh, the overall goal was to maintain a minimum deployment density. And so if nodes are destroyed, to maintain that density, they should have other nodes move. Now, how does the actual movement occur? Nobody ever believes me unless I show them the video, so I started bringing the video. These things all had solid propellant rocket engines attached to them. Oh, wow. That's what that looked like. <laughs> this was the first time we ever fired rocket. <laughs> it was very scary. That, exactly, that's it. This is that project. So. So this was the first time we ever fired rockets. Um, we ended up firing dozens, maybe hundreds of rockets over the course of several demos spaced out several months apart. Uh, but the idea was you, you know, build this map, you wait for one of your neighbors to disappear, and when it disappears, you move using these rockets. So now... <laughs> Sorry? Is this moving a random event? It, no, it was actually fairly, so we didn't build the rocket. So Sensoria was one of three or four subcontractors. One of the subcontractors was just the mobility subsystem. Essentially, it was a node that was, was circular, about eight inches high. And on each side, top and bottom, there were four solid propellant rockets, each of which had a nozzle aimed in one of the four cardinal directions. The thing had an accelerometer, so you knew if you were upside down or right side up. And it had a compass so you knew which way you were turned. Based, and you had a record of which rockets you'd fired in the past. So based on all this information, you know which rockets you have remaining and which movement vectors you have available to you. The rockets and the novels and everything had been specifically engineered so that you'd go just about eight meters in a nice parabolic arch and then come to a stop. It worked more or less. I mean, you know, it was, you know sometimes it would be nine meters or sometimes the thing would start rolling. But it wasn't totally random. You could actually pick which direction you wanted to go. So... The difference here is that, so now you saw our demo system back here. Comparatively, the stakes in this system are fairly low. You know, it's a demo system. And if something fails, if one of the nodes goes down, if something, you know, if the radio change, if the radio ranges change as they do constantly, if the connectivity changes, if something goes wrong with time sync, if any number of things happen and somebody walks over, the worst that we happen is start waving our hands and just, oh, hey, look at this poster, isn't it pretty? Now, over here, you know, we're firing rockets, right? So it turns out, when, you, when I first described this application to people, most of their time, their reaction is, well, that sounds pretty easy. You just, you just, you know, draw the map. You've got time sync. You've got your signal processing. So you just do the acoustic ranging. You know, that's easy, especially if you've already built this. And then, you know, how hard could it be just to watch for some neighbor, you know, just send them a ping every once in a while when they disappear and fire a rocket? It sounds easy. 
if you actually look at the system, it ended up being something on the order of 22 daemons, which were running, involving hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Maybe 10% of that work has anything to do with sort of the, what I thought was the hard part of the problem. The hard part sounds like it's doing the acoustic ranging and building the map. It turns out where we spent the vast majority of our time was all of this other stuff, in that there's all these dynamics of all of the sort of automatic self-configuration. How do you build this? How do you form these clusters, form the physical network topology? How do you do the um, neighbor discovery in a way which is both sensitive enough to detect changes, but selective enough in that you don't want to immediately start firing rockets just because you know a couple packets get lost? The whole purpose of this is to detect failures, is to detect neighbors that are gone. There's a huge amount of network dynamics that can look like a network failure, but isn't. In many cases, for example, if you're trying to build a routing algorithm, or almost anything else I had ever done in my life, the cost of failure was low. Maybe it means you send 5% more packets than optimal, or you take a route that's 10% longer than optimal or something. In this case, we're firing rockets, and so the cost of false positives was very high. And so what we ended up having to do was this enormous, enormous amount of engineering to add filtering to every layer, to try to understand the dynamics as much as possible, and to try to get this thing so that you, the actual demo was we deployed, we didn't have any control input to the rockets firing. What you saw was the actual rockets that you saw fire, it was a 10 second video, but this was, these things had been deployed two hours earlier, had sit there quietly for two hours, and the only control input on our part was walking, well, somebody walked up, actually remotely, basically just turned off the power to one of them. And then 30 seconds later, you saw those rockets fire. Getting that level of reactivity to dynamics while being insensitive to the two hours worth of crap that happens in the network beforehand turned out to be a very hard problem. My personal favorite part of it, though, was writing the rocket thruster device driver. <laughs> so it is this problem that I've just described, which is what led us to MSTAR, which is what I promised at the beginning of the talk is what I talk about at the end, in that we started, or at least I personally started out doing time sync, and Lou started out doing this signal processing stuff and acoustic ranging, and when we went and built a real application that needed it, it turns out that these problems really played, and almost any other problem you can imagine, played second fiddle to understanding and being sensitive to the dynamics in the network. So I'm not going to talk, you know, MSTAR is it's like three blind men and the elephant. You can, there are lots and lots of different things it looks like. I'm just going to talk about the sort of simulation environment a little bit, which is that what MSTAR lets you do, it's also sort of a programming model. I'm not going to be talking about the programming model part. What I will talk about just a bit is MSTAR's simulator, in that what it lets you do is take the same code, run it in simulation, and run the same code in deployment. So it's different in that sense from something like NS. Um, NS is a very popular network simulator. The problem is that you can't take NS code and then actually run it on the internet. Um, there's a different, you can, you, the, the flow of its ideas, sort of conceptual ideas, are what flow from NS to actual deployments. For us, we wanted to actually just debug the code for real, not just take algorithms, but actually take debug code. Um, and that by the time you get to rockets firing, you want to be pretty sure the code is working. So what MSTAR lets you do is simulate the same code that you're deploying. Um, however, it's not just a simulator. A big aspect of it, so I'm actually very glad you asked this question. You asked what's the radio range. This turns out to be a very difficult question because it's not one that you can answer deterministically. It changes over time. Um, it's affected by the environment. It's affected by among other things. And it turns out that if you write code in a simulator, which assumes, for example, a nice perfect circular radio model, I still read paper after paper that assumes a circular radio model. So the circular model is you have a node, you draw a perfect circle around it, you're inside the circle, you receive 100% of packets. You move one millimeter outside the circle, and suddenly you receive 0% of packets. It's a beautiful model, and if life was that easy, you know, a lot of our lives would get easier. The problem is that if you write software that assumes that, and then go and put it out in a field, especially, so you saw the nodes were in an actual field with grass and things, and when you get these low power radios and put them close to the ground, things get even worse. Things are not in any way similar to a perfect circle once you get into the field. And so what we found was that it is extremely helpful to be able to get early experience with the way actual radios act. This is now the ceiling of our lab. We have several dozen radios, essentially just network interfaces mounted on the ceiling. So MSTAR has a pure simulation mode that I was describing a little bit before. The, it has a simulated channel model, just like every other simulator. 
So what makes mstar unique is that it has this other mode where you give it a slightly different command line switch, and instead of running in simulation, it runs mostly in simulation, but whenever one of your simulated nodes tries to send a packet, it goes out over a wire to one of these real radios and gets actually transmitted over the real radio. It gets received by some other set of radios where it then goes back over another wire into the tra back into the simulator. So you have this set of simulated nodes which can't interact, they aren't allowed to interact with each other in any way except by going through this real channel that's on the ceiling. It turns out you end up being, you see a lot of really interesting dynamics using the ceiling array that you don't see in a pure simulation because this is a real channel. There's no channel model, it's just an actual channel. Now the problem with this is that it's a channel, it's not all possible channels. If your plan is to eventually deploy your application onto our ceiling of our lab, then it's probably a very good simulation. But if you're planning on, let's say, going out and deploying in a forest or something, it's less good of a simulation. So we have another thing which we call a portable array, which is all exactly the same hardware and software, but instead of a big simulation server with a bunch of permanently mounted uh, radios in the ceiling, we have instead a laptop, which is just out of the frame here, and a cart with hundreds of feet of cable and portable network interfaces and a bunch of car batteries and things like that. So you can go and deploy it out in the real environment um, to get, again, now the real dynamics of the real environment. But it still looks mostly like a simulation. So when I say it looks like a simulation, that means all the node software is running centrally. You have a perfect debugging back channel to get as much debugging information out of it. You have the perfect visibility into what the software is doing as you would in a simulation. So the idea is that you have... What MSTAR does is it take, lets you take the same code in every case and expose it to a number of different execution environments. You start out in pure simulation where you can do very large scale um, because you're not constrained by actual hardware. You can just keep buying bigger and bigger simulation servers and soon MSTAR will have also parallel simulation modes. You can just buy more and more simulation servers. So the advantage of this is it's very large scale. The disadvantage is it's very unrealistic. Then you can move forward to the next point on our scale, which is the ceiling array, which is now significantly more realistic, but also much smaller scale because now you're constrained by the actual hardware that you own, the hardware that's on the ceiling. And then finally, you go to the portable array, which is now yet more realistic because you're now actually in the final target environment, but again, it's much smaller scale. In this case, it's necessarily smaller scale because this scale, in fact, is not just reality. You can think of this as reality sort of slash inconvenience. And then as you get closer and closer to the real world, of course, it gets closer and closer. It gets harder and harder to do bigger and bigger tests. The ceiling array is very easy because it's permanently wired. It's permanently mounted. It's always there. You can be sitting at home in your underwear doing a simulation 10 times. And on the 11th time, just give it this command line switch, and the same software runs on the ceiling. The portable array is small, necessarily smaller scale because now it involves this expedition out to a park and deploying things and a day of, you know, trying to avoid getting bitten by bugs and that kind of thing. The idea, though, is that what this line is here is this, what I sort of call the line of high visibility. These are, these are execution environments that more or less look like a simulation. And if you attack the problem from all these different angles, from the scale angle here and from the reality angle here, if it works, if the same code works in all these different execution environments, then what you hope is that when you actually go to the deployment, in which you finally now jumped off of this nice, comfortable, high you know, visibility line. Now you're in this regime where the software is running in actual distributed nodes. There's often not a back channel for which, uh, with which you can get all the nice, you know, wonderful debugging information back. The idea is that now you have some clue as to what's happening because you've seen the way it's acting in all these other regimes. And we felt this was a huge advantage over the old way of writing software, which was either going directly to this point or maybe starting out in some simulation and then going from simulate an unrealistic simulation structure directly to the actual deployment. What MSTAR does is it gives you this spectrum of different execution environments that let you uh, get a much better sense for how your software is going to react in the real world before you actually get to the deployment. So this is a very nice uh, development environment. Can you say something about programming models and how does that actually to facilitate the user's writing software? Um, I can. In fact, I have a whole talk about that, but it's a, I don't, I don't think I have any of the slides in this, in this talk. Essentially, what we try to do, so we, we take, so this, it, this is a, uh, a Linux uh, software environment, and we take a lot of our inspiration from just sort of the Linux, or more generally the Unix design philosophy, of uh, decomposing a problem into as many different processes, as, as many subtasks as possible, and then representing each of those subtasks actually as a Unix process. So 
we have a lot of different processes, each of which has one specific task, such as neighbor discovery, uh, device drivers, of course. Um, and then the, these things are all interconnected using a form of inter-process communication um, that we implemented, uh, something called FUSE, which stands for the Framework for User Space Devices, which is essentially a microkernel extension to Linux. Um, it's a method for uh, basically being able to implement device driver-like services from user space. So the neighbor discovery service, for example, actually looks like a device driver. It, produ it produces a device called Dev Neighbors. Um, you can read from it. Every time you read from it, it gives you a list of neighbors. And it turns out, you know, this is a 30-second introduction to a you know, much larger thing. But um, by decomposing the system in this way, it turns out it's much easier to sort of factor out common services from applications and reduce the amount of domain-specific work you have to do every time you implement a new application. So TOS, so there are two questions there I think you're asking. One is how similar is it to TOS? In many ways it is similar, the modularity aspects of it are very similar to TOS. The difference is that we're specifically, we're targeting larger nodes that would run a sort of a more general purpose operating system like Linux. So we end up being able to do much more in the way of interactivity. Um, uh, debugging is much easier. For example, you can log into a node and you, know, there you examine you know, dozens of different state variables as to what the current neighbor list is and that kind of thing. So we, we're targeted specifically at these larger nodes that run Linux. And so every aspect of the system takes advantage of that. So that's how it differs from TOS. Um, TOS sim, though, is a simulator in that it's essentially just, whoops, it's just this point. Where did this go? It's just this point. Um, it's a pure simulator, which has a radio model built into it. Um, and what MSTAR focuses on is not just the simulation, um, but the fact that you can go through all these other execution environments, each of which, uh, or some of which are much more realistic than a simulation. Yep. You said simulation being a single process or a single, single machine program running, or set the machine? The simulator? Yes. Um, the simulator is, uh, so each, a single node in the actual deployment is modeled as a single processor which runs some number of processes, and then the simulator will run that sort of tree of processes once for every simulated node. So for example, if a simulated node, if a single node has, let's say, 10 processes, and you're trying to simulate 100 nodes, you end up with a simulation that has 1,000 processes running, each of which is essentially given a piece of the uh, directory, it, it, they all communicate sort of through this device hierarchy. Each of them, there's some name mangling that happens, that each of them has a sort of a piece of the device hierarchy allocated to them. And they're not allowed to communicate with each other except through either the channel model, if it's a pure simulation, or through the actual channel, if it's a one of the uh, array uh, versions. OK. Any other questions here? Yeah. OK, so I will just conclude. Um, and describe a little bit about what I'm doing today. Um, the, uh, my current project actually is uh, wireless, is working on this seismic application with SENS. So SENS is the Center for Embedded Network Sensing, um, which is a new NSF-funded center that uh, we have at UCLA. It's a 10-year uh, grant that just started two years ago. And we're involved in a number of different projects. One of them is uh, in conjunction with the uh, geophysicists and the seismologists at UCLA. Um, they want to build a better or they would like to have built for them, I should say, a better way of collecting seismic data. Um, seismology and geophysics are very data-driven science. Um, they do a huge amount of data collection, um, you know, sensing earthquakes and, and then reasoning about them, or reasoning about the structure of the Earth based on the earthquakes. Right now, there's sort of two state-of-the-arts. The state-of-the-art state is two different ways of collecting data in seismology. One is attaching lots of seismometers to the Internet, so on college campuses and play other places where you have Internet connectivity. Um, and that gives you nice real-time data back. For example, if you're in LA and you feel an earthquake, you can go to this web page and it shows you immediately where the earthquake came from. That's because of all these internet connected seismometers. The other way, for the geophysicists, usually they want to study a particular area of the Earth, and so they have to go out and deploy, let's say, over the San Gabriel Mountains or in Mexico or in some other place where you don't have universal internet access. So the current state of the art there is that you actually take these things and record data to flash and then go out six months later on an expedition and visit every seismometer and take the flash, and half the time discover the thing only recorded for five minutes before stopping because of some problem. So what they want is a, the best of both worlds. They want to be able to deploy in some place where there's no ubiquitous internet access available, 
but they still sort of have this internet style of getting data back continuously and in real time. Um, so this is what I'm working on now. Uh, it's really sort of the perfect marriage of everything I did while I was a graduate student. Um, they also don't like using GPS for time sync for various reasons. Um, so this uses RBS, everything you heard about in the first half of the talk, to distribute time out to the network. Um, and then it uses MSTAR to do sort of all the dynamic uh, automatic routing and that kind of thing to get the data to be able to reliably be delivered back from the network. Ideally, what we'd like to end up with is both a system that pushes on the boundaries of distributed systems research, but also is useful to the scientists. This is a problem. It's, it's a, the model of working with scientists who actually want the data is a very powerful one, and that you end up with a system that somebody actually uses and needs for something. And I think we have not yet quite reached the point in sensor networks where a person who has nothing to do with sensor networks, let's say a scientist studying you know, some random thing, has written a paper saying, this is data that I would not have been able to collect had the sensor network not existed. Um, so ideally, that's what you want. I mean, we're all here theoretically for that reason, is because somebody wants all this data. Um, so where are these people who want the data? So working with the scientists who actually want the data is certainly a very critical step the problem is that they want the data, and so that means they don't want a weird experimental system that is likely to not give them the data because you know one of our experimental routing algorithms failed or something. So it's a very interesting idea. Um, it's a very powerful one. I think collaborations with the scientists who actually need the data is crucial, but it is this very fine line to walk between the practical uses <coughs> for the, the people who want the data and the people who want to do systems research. Um, so just to become, you know, just to go to a little higher level. Everything I've talked about so far has been sensor network related. I think there are a huge number of lessons though, that we can bring back to the internet. Um, one of them is this idea of sort of autonomous self-healing software, I think is a fairly powerful one. Um, so what you saw was that we were sort of forced down this area because there were tanks in the field and we couldn't go out and you know, sort of manually tweak the software and get it to work. I think there are a lot of users just of desktop software that would appreciate if their software worked as robustly as if there was a tank there. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting ways of writing software that in many ways is sort of self-healing um, um, or it works around its own errors, which I think we can bring back to non-sensor non network related areas. Also things like location awareness. Um, just about everything you always do in the sensor network is, is has some location awareness. Almost any re distributed reasoning about data, um, your position is constantly something you're thinking about. I think this is something which is just starting sort of in the internet and sort of traditional wireless worlds is taking advantage of location. So I think there's a lot of the actual localization technology itself, I think, is something we can start to bring back, but also some of the ideas of what do you do with location once you have it. So the high level point here is there's lots of interesting research directions we've gone down, which we've sort of been forced into because it's required by sensor networks, but which I think really can uh, benefit the larger distributed systems community as a whole. For that, unless there are any other questions, thank you very much for listening. So this is a really